It's like a microphone with a... It goes around your neck. Really? It's got like... Is that... Is this one out? Is that... Does that work? Uh, can push the button to make that looks like a If I do that, I can... Yeah, it's just not very loud. It's just not very loud. Okay. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Oh god, don't set the expectations too high. I'm supposed to, you're supposed to under promise and over deliver. I've been at the BAE thing in at a Connects a few months ago. Oh. You know where the BAE meet up, Jody. Jody, where are you from? Um, I work for myself, um, ah. but I, I'm in, in the construction industry, so I've okay. used Day Connects, been one of their major clients. Oh. Uh, friends with them. Don't hold it against me. So, <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah. What part of construction? Um, systems. I used to work with your competitor. Oh, right. Project Center or yeah. one of those? Project Center, oh. yeah. Okay, okay. One of their people. Right. Um, and I wanted to work for Aphex, but um, right. never could fit. It didn't fit the team, so. Yeah. Oh, well, take yeah. your card. We're hiring. <laughs> I still don't fit the team. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I run the team and I'm right. changing in the structure right. completely. Right. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, you, yeah, you were talking about um, how you run your team mm. uh, at the VA meetup. Oh, were we? So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How punctual are we supposed to be? Oh, it's only 1.14. Too early. No, no. Oh, yeah. How many people haven't yet decided? It looks to me like most people have made a call on where they're going to spend the next little while. Yep, there's not many people milling, so let's get going. Uh, Hands up, who was at Agile Australia this year? A few, okay. Uh, how many people saw this talk there? Not many, not many? A couple, a couple. okay. Don't give away the jokes because this is a replay. <laughs> Haven't got any new jokes. Uh, so it's called why nothing you ever do might make the slightest difference and how the theory of constraints can help. So I want to get a quick understanding of who's in the room. Uh, one of my favourite subjects is mental models. Uh, so I'm going to have a gradation of sophistication of mental models of theory of constraints. Uh, the lowest grade of mental model is you have no idea what something is. Uh, and if I use an example like, like water, uh, there are many mental models of water. So, uh, you know, a Martian would have no mental model. Uh, a normal sort of person, you know, would have a mental model that's this, uh, something you drink, or you, if you're not English, something you bathe in. Ah, uh, <laughs> oh, that was new. That was new. <laughs> uh, the next mental model that someone who's been to secondary school in a in a Western uh, democracy would know it's H2O. Uh, apparently, so this is where I am with water. That's my mental model of water. Okay. It encompasses that and it goes there. Apparently the next level of mental model for water is that. So structurally the hydrogen and the, the oxygen is in the middle and the hydrogen on the outside, so it's kind of cool. And then the next one is the oxygen is about that big and it's sort of Mickey Mouse. So th this is the oxygen and that's a little... That's, very bad attempt at a sphere. Okay, so that's that's the sophisticated mental model of a, of a water molecule. The oxygen's about that big, and uh, there's you know 144 degree angle, right? So you can have. And the thing about mental models is they're all valid. They're all valid. They're valid for a purpose. So 
you know, that, that ex that's sort of all I need in terms of life, getting on with life. So I've, I'm overcooked on my necessary mental model. So, the question is, what is the room's mental model of theory of constraints? Hands up who is here. Okay? Hands up who is here. Okay? Here. A few. Here. Oh. And here. Is that a hand? Or is that a nose pick? <laughs> that was a hand? Okay. Well, full disclosure, I'm about here. Alright? I already knew I was in trouble with Jason. I didn't see anyone else's hand, right? But I'm about here, right? So, uh, the good news is that I have nothing to sell you. I have no interest in your success. I have nothing to gain from your success or your failure. I don't care if nothing you ever do makes the slightest difference. But I am thoroughly disappointed in you all, uh, which is probably not a good way to start. But let me... So that, that's, that's me, Jane Truss, Jimmy J68, if you like the talk. If you don't, I'm Jason Yip. Thanks for the computer. Uh, definition of six done for this talk. Uh, has three parts. It's, it's sort of weird having two screens. Number one is that you know more about theory of constraints an hour from now, uh, uh, more in an hour than you do now. That's one. Uh, number two is that you you think there's something practical you could use, an idea you could actually put to use. Uh, and number three is that you uh, have a smile on your face. So, judging by the number of newbies in the room, uh, I can probably tick off number one pretty easily. So. The reason I'm all, uh, I'm very disappointed in you all, you all being representative of the agile, lean community, uh, is, is, is this story. So, uh, Agile Australia 2011, uh, so just over a year ago was in Sydney, and I was at Agile Australia, uh, you know, in a break, checking the Twitter feed, being all hip, when I saw that this guy had died. Dr. Eli Goldratt, uh, the inventor of the theory of constraints, died. I was a bit slow on the uptake. He died about a month before Agile Australia. <laughs> it was like, you know, I'm a, some weeks I'm just right only in Twitter. Um, that's okay. So I was like, oh, gee, that's, oh, sh oh, shit, that's no good. So I go back in and everyone's having coffee in the break and I'm like, so I go up to someone and go, oh man, I'm so bummed, I just heard they like, God, they died. I'm like, who? <laughs> what do you mean? You know, it's Terence C. You know. No, what? Weird guy. All right, next guy. Oh, I'm so bummed, I just heard they like, God, they died. It's like, who? Uh, so I, I sort of shaking a few people going, my God, what's going on? I had no idea how stupid you all were. So... <laughs> I promised myself then I'd come back to Agile Australia 2012 and talk about TOC at an introductory level because uh, I can't believe it's not better understood and more widely understood. It's part of our Agile heritage. It kicks Lean's butt as far as I'm concerned. Sorry, Jason. But, you know, it's like it's more meta than Agile and Lean and hopefully I'll get some of that across. So, I got a whole bunch of guru love for this man, right? So, and this is my favourite photo of him. It's a photo on the cover of his last book called The Choice. Um, it's probably not the best book, but it's my favourite photo because he's this guy, he's this wise old, really wise old guy. And his special subject, his spe we all have superpowers, right? So, his superpower is asking questions that make you squirm. That's his superpower. So he can sit there in his armchair with his cigar and say, why do you think anything you do matters? <laughs> you know, not, he doesn't say that exactly, but that's his special power. The questions that make you go, ah, okay, I'll get back to you, right? <laughs> and and that, you know, it's, the, it's the Socratic method, if you're familiar with that. It's, it's, you know, it's asking you questions until you make it clear to yourself that you're an idiot. <laughs> you know, by that very gentle way. So, uh, that's the story. So, in, in Agile Australia 2011, it was the 10th anniversary of Agile, so called. Everyone was in this, you know, 10 years reflective kind of mood. Uh, 
in a former life uh, with Jason, I was an agile consultant. I'm better now. So, but so the ten year span was sort of appropriate for me as well. Uh, so it was part of that reflection on the ten years, and I'd better do something to improve the awareness of TSC. So that's the why. So I did this at Agile Australia. Uh, did a quick review of the slides this morning, and here we are. So. What is TOC? That's a good place to start. So there are many parts, and I should start by saying there are uh, TOC is a big topic. Uh, the the TOC handbook, which you can buy on Amazon if you like, is about 1,200 pages. It's big. Uh, there are international conferences on TOC where thousands of people attend, uh, and I've never been to one. There uh, is. TOC International Certification Organization where you can get accredited to be a TOC person with the blah blah level of the blah blah and I have none of those. So there are many parts. So I just, you know, the takeaway is it's big, okay? Uh, two of the core parts uh, are these two parts. So how systems work. So here we are at the Lean, Agile, and Systems Thinking Conference. So this is definitely under the Systems Thinking category. Uh, and that's where a lot of people focus. When they think about TOC, they think of it as a systems, uh, you know, an approach to uh, systems like Lean. And it has an awful lot in common with that. It's, it's in my opinion, 100% compatible with, with Lean. Uh, but then there's this other part, which I've actually found equally, if not more useful, which is this whole other thing about how thinking works, which is fascinating and no one knows anything about it and we're going to change that today. So, do you see what I did there? That was pretty cool. That's about the extent of my visual sort of wow. That's my visual wow, right? So think of TOC as a systems thinking thing. Big. It's big and it's systems thinking. So, step one, the good news is we've got more time now than we had at Agile Australia, so we should actually be able to get through all this. So number one, how systems work. So, who's familiar with lean, value streams, all that blah blah? Really? Come on, more than that. Hands up, come on. No? Okay. Jeez, Jason, you better talk about lean. So, a system in this context is a bunch of stuff that you do to create some happy of some kind, right? So you, you, you know, you buy the food, you chop the food, you cook the food, you and you're happy, right? Some kind or sequence of things, and it's not necessarily linear. It can be, you know, all that multi-threaded parallel stuff. But you do some stuff, and you get some definition of happy at the end. That's all a system is. Uh, so that's pretty easy, and it's the same as a value stream. So, when does TOC apply? There were two criteria that Goldratt defined, and this is it. Uh, so prerequisite one for TOC to apply to your scenario is that you have dependent activities. That just means something has to happen after something else, right? So don't go all waterfall on my ass. That's just, you have to write the code before you test it, right? Until someone can tell me you can do that in reverse order, I'm going to say they're dependent activities. So you have the idea, you build it, you test it, you deploy it, you get your happy. So in software development, it's pretty uh, easy to meet that prerequisite that we have dependent activities. Uh, Batch size is a whole different discussion. The second prerequisite is that those activities vary in how much time they take. So I think that's pretty easy to meet as well. I don't know of any software development team where user stories come through and they take exactly the same amount of time to code, no matter what the story is, or exactly the same amount of time to test. The whole problem with software is it's as non-linear as hell, right? So if it's pretty easy to meet those prerequisites, then TOC applies. Now remember the T in TOC is theory, okay? None of this is proven, it's a theory. And Goldratt spent his life, uh, or the half of his life that I'm aware of, applying the theory to different industries. He never got around to software, okay? Um, 
apart from one book he wrote which is about enterprise resource planning systems and their application, uh, but not really software development uh, in any way, shape or form. But um, he applied the theory to different uh, industries. His first book was about a manufacturing plant. Then he applied it to the problem of distribution. He applied it to the problem of retail. Uh, he applied it to the problem of uh, service delivery. And the implementation you get of TOC in each of those scenarios is different. But the, the idea, the thinking process is the same. So if we agree we meet those prerequisites, then the theory would say TOC applies. And you go, OK, well, big deal. Uh, the problem is some of the inferences that TOC draws from that are frightening, if they're true. So the takeaway is, if it's true and it applies and we ignore its conclusions, we're in trouble. So that's just a little thing to... That's my first little attempt at making you squirm a little. So if we have this system, let's say in our software scenario, Maybe we have our idea, maybe we build it, maybe we test it, and that's our definition of happy there's some software feature. doesn't matter. So in the value stream sense, TOC is focused on the capacity of each of those steps. So we might have a capacity in this activity A of 12 units of blah blah per week. Uh, and we might have five, a capacity of 5 in stage B and a capacity of 8 in step C. So that's how much they could possibly get done for whatever reason. Who would like, here's our first question for the audience, who would like to guess what the maximum, the TOC term is throughput. You can just think of it as the output. Uh, uh, what's the maximum throughput I could get from that system in that unit of time? It's not a trick question. Need to know the relationship. No, you don't. Five, correct. So just think of yourself as pulling stuff through in the lean sense, the most you could ever pull through. Not guaranteeing you'll get five. Not guaranteeing you'll get five. You need to know the relationships to what you're actually going to actually get. So that's one to one. <coughs> the theoretical maximum. Yes, yes, sorry. Yes, those, the units of measure are the same. Yes, yes, sorry. They are, they are 12 somethings, 5 somethings, and 8 somethings, yes. Sorry, misunderstood. So the most you can get is 5. Okay. So what's going to happen if I run activity A flat out? Jason knows he's a lean guy. What happens? Correct. You just pile stuff up in front of B. Right? That's what you do. Okay? So just imagine all of these people working flat out as fast as they can. All that's going to happen is that this pile of work is going to pile up in front of B and never disappear. Does that... Has anyone got a problem with that? In theory? Not a problem with it being a good thing or a bad thing. Does that naturally follow? that if you run them all flat out and they just go as fast as they can, that's what will happen. Okay. Now, I had the good fortune to spend some formative years in a manufacturing plant in the 90s, which was kind of cool. Uh, computer hardware manufacturing environment. And when you've got a physical environment, you can actually walk around the production line. Uh, you can see the piles of stuff. Okay? You can see, there's this guy, and you can see how fast he's doing the, in, in my uh, case it was testing network cards and testing memory modules. So you can see the guy taking one, testing it, waiting for the green light, putting it in the box. You can see how fast that's happening and you can see how big the pile is, right? You get an intuition for the problems. So one of the fundamental issues we have in the software space is you can't see the piles, right? Everyone just looks like they're working and you have no, you know, these piles of work have been abstracted and squashed and hidden in, they're in emails and they're in rally and they're in, you know, piles of story cards. You just can't see them. That's one of the key problems. But that's what happens. And the problem, which is, again, easy to grasp in a physical production environment, is that that pile of crap 
costs money, right? So that work in progress that's sitting between step A and B, if that's a, net, a memory card that's sort of half built, you had to buy the chips that went on it, you had to buy the board. So that's money tied up in that work in progress. So that's one of the key issues with it. The other is that uh, is the lead time issue that that creates. So something I pop in this end has to wait for all of that to process through so your lead time blows out and lean, you know, is all over that stuff. So why did people do when confronted with this situation? Uh, if you go back 30 years in the manufacturing sort of game, they tried to do this. They said, why am I wasting all this money employing those 12 idiots at A? I'll just sack seven of them and have five. And why am I wasting time with these eight idiots at C? I'll, I'll sack three of them and I'll have five. And that's called balanced capacity. So there's a whole, you know, bunch of people who made a living for years doing balanced capacity planning and this kind of stuff. Uh, would anyone like to hazard a guess as to what kind of throughput you'll get in that situation? Correct, less than five. So the reason is, so the theoretical maximum you would get is still intuitively five, if everything just flew through. But the problem is prerequisite number two, which is the time varying nature of it. So if at step B, the gold rate used to say Murphy strikes. So when Murphy strikes at step B, oh, oh shit, a wheel fell off the machine. Oh, okay. All of a sudden, the five at B for the next hour is zero. Okay? And then that means C is starved. So C has capacity that has to idle, so you don't get any throughput. So, uh, in that kind of manufacturing environment, the model that TOC brings uh, to bear to balance the irreconcilable issue, because fundamentally here we have an irreconcilable issue that the way to get the maximum throughput is to have huge buffers in front of everything. Okay, so if you want to guarantee that C never runs out of things to do, you have a big buffer in front of it. Uh, and if you want to guarantee that B never runs out of work, you have a huge buffer in front of it. The problem is the money that that ties up in working process and the lead time that creates. So you can never resolve that tension. But to balance it, the TOC model is called drum buffer rope. Uh, the drum, so I should probably get to the obvious point that this is the constraint in the original model. Step B is the constraint. It determines the maximum throughput of the whole system. So it's the constraint. So it sets the pace. The buffers manage the risk of it starving. And the rope is the withholding of work that gets released upstream of that. But I don't want to go too much into that. Any questions so far? Now, one thing I have to tell you about me is I'm legally blind. So if you want to get my attention, you have to do a little more than just this. You know, just a little more. And if I ask a question, don't you got a little more than just this? So vocalise, yell out. I'm happy to stop. I'm happy to ramble. I did that already. Any questions or anything? Anyone want to stop me or? I've got a question just in terms of before you move on. Sorry? I just got a good question before you move on. Yep. So in the first model, you still have the same problem that B could have a problem. You, you still have it. Sorry, you still have the same. You still have the problem that B could have a wheel falling off. Yes. And you might still get three. Correct. Correct. You do. So, okay. So that both are five or less than five. Both are five at best or less. Correct. Yes. Both are five, less than five. This one is almost guaranteed to be less than five. But yes, they're both theoretical maximum of five. Why did you choose three? That's a random number. I could. I could. <laughs> That's the definition of random. One, yeah. One to four. One to four. Yeah. Yep. 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 You can you can form a cue and bite me later. There's a hand. We'll get there. <laughs> 
Welcome to my world. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, anyone? Uh, generalists? Huh? Yeah, yeah. There you go. What a crazy, crazy idea. Okay. So the bad news. So here we are. Remember the context of this is Agile Australia, and the context is. Uh, uh, so I'm a guy like Jason who was around 10 years ago trying to convince people like Nav and Telstra to do this agile shit and they're like, yeah, whatever. Like, and now 10 years later, yeah, it's all Telstra and Nav, blah, blah, right? So you've got a whole bunch of, there's a critical mass of people who who are coming and going, oh, Agile's cool, like I've got to learn about my Agiles, I've got to get my stamp and I've got to get my thing. And, and what terrifies me is that there's a whole bunch of people at Agile Australia who are running Team A, right? So I meet them and they tell me about their work and in my head I'm seeing this system and your Team A and you're going to go back to your boss and go, I can do 18 blah blahs now with the same people because I've got my certified scrum master hat on and I can get 18 now. And I'm like, good, I can then shoot half your people because I don't, like, it's not going to make any difference. <laughs> right? Don't do that. Like, don't go back to your boss and say, I can do a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't matter faster. <laughs> your boss is going to go, <laughs> right? This is bad to try and tell go, everyone what we're going to do is go do everything faster. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Don't do that. Right? And here's the bigger problem. So let's say, because everyone has a scope. So in your role, you might be a team leader of a team that's part of a bigger team, and everything's fractal. So this whole team that can pump out five on that first row is part of a larger system. Right? So in another from another perspective, that whole team that's producing five whatevers is just part of a larger system. And if that larger system, A and that larger system can only do three, or step C can only do four, then nothing matters from the overall picture of the organization's definition of happiness. It doesn't matter, right? So, uh, uh, what TOC provides is a process of ongoing improvement, which seems like a familiar concept. That's sort of what people would say, well, that's what Agile does. We inspect and we adapt. And what, uh, I'll get back to what Goldratt would say about Agile. You won't like it. <laughs> So this is the TOC, Process of Ongoing Improvement. It's based on the idea of a constraint. Step one is to work out what that is. That sounds easy. It's not. Uh, number two is you exploit it. So in the book, The Goal, which I'll show you a picture of later, uh, they identify the constraint as this particular machine. Uh, so, uh, okay, this particular machine is not producing stuff. It's determining the throughput of the whole plant. So exploiting it means Okay, nobody goes to lunch. This machine works 24 hours a day, right? Don't change anything else in the whole place, but nobody goes to lunch who's working on this machine. We do shifts and we do all this magic. That's what exploit means. Uh, don't change anything. Subordinate everything else means, in that diagram where A was producing 12 and B was producing 5, is you detune A to only produce 5, uh, and when a breaks down, what happens is the buffer in front of B drops and your risk goes up, your risk of B starving. Remember, you'd never want this constraint to starve. So when the buffer starts to drop and A comes back online, A needs what's called protective capacity. So you drive it to seven or eight to feed B and also replenish the buffer. So you actually need, and that's the essential argument for why you can't have balanced capacity. Because when you recover from a problem, you need protective capacity to get your buffers back up and get your risk back down. Does that make sense? Probably not, but you know, really, that's okay. I've got nothing to sell you. Um, so that's, you subordinate everything else to constraint. You then elevate the constraint. So that's when you go, okay, everyone's working at five, we're all focused on helping this guy not starve. How can we 
elevate the whole system. Turn that five into six, turn that six into seven, turn that seven into eight. And what happens when you do that is you move the constraint. So you have to, after you've elevated it, check you haven't moved it because what would happen is we took that five to six to seven to eight to nine, now step C that was at eight is the constraint. And then that becomes where you focus. So that's the process of ongoing improvement. Now, when Goldratt was asked, how does TOC relate to Lean and Agile and Six Sigma and all that other popular stuff? His answer was that it applies at one of these, all those things apply at one of these five steps. Who would like to guess which one? Elevate. Elevate. Correct. Correct. Elevate. So, when you found the point that matters in your organization that's holding you back, you go, that's what we have to improve. That's when you lean Agile Six Sigma the hell out of that to bring it up for the same amount of money if you can. Uh, the other key metric in TOC is operating expense, which you and I are. Uh, we, that's what we represent. We don't represent throughput, we represent operating expense. So for the same operating expense, get more out of that thing. That's where the tools come in. So my message to the whole people who have got the drunk the agile Kool-Aid is to be aware that there are higher order systems thinking models that have a role for Agile. Agile is not the god of the universe. Right? It's like a tool you use from this perspective, it's just a tool you use when you've found the problem you want to deal with. Okay? So don't go and make your Twitter handle Agile Julia because you might as well say I'm you know, fourth order problem focused Julia, right? It's like, <laughs> I, I, I worry about like the thing that doesn't really matter, Julia, right? I, it really freaks me out when people's Twitter handles say, I'm Agile Joe and I'm Agile and I'm like, oh shit, I missed the point, Joe, right? <laughs> so that's the feedback from TOC to Agile is you don't matter as much as you think you do. So. Gold Rat was asked, I don't know why the session was popular, it's like it's some bad news. So, like, so Gold Rat was asked to uh, distill TOC into a single word. One word. Someone asked him this question. And like, you know, he's in his couch, you know, with his cigar, he died of cancer. <laughs> he's got his pipe, and totally unfazed, said, no problem. Who would like to guess what the word is? Come on. Come on. One word. Feedback. Someone said it. Focus. Focus. If I had a prize, I'd give it to the person I can't see who said that. Is <laughs> that Eric? No, no, next to Eric. Oh, okay. Next to Eric. Sorry, I don't have a prize. I can give you Jason's computer. <laughs> Thanks for the computer, Jason. Focus. 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 TOC tells you where to focus. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So, reasons why nothing you ever do might make the slightest difference. Number one. There's seven. Seven's a random number. I just ran out of time. I had to submit the presentation, but there's... Number one, you're trying to improve something that's not a constraint. Okay, so here's a little, little thought bubble for you. Okay, this is where I try and scare people, right? Okay, so you're the CIO of Big Telco. You, and you get the agile blah blahs, you see all the... Everyone's doing Agile, I better do Agile. Okay, everybody, let's be Agile, right? Let's get 4,000 certified Scrum Masters and let's get 4,000 Scrum Boards. Okay, so you've now got 4,000 Scrum Teams all going faster. Okay, 
how many of those 4,000 teams could possibly, theoretically, be working on the constraint? One. So 3,999 of them are Waste. wasting their time. That's the scary thing. Hello, big telco. <laughs> right? Why do you do that? Don't do that. It's really dumb. So back when I was an agile consultant, uh, somebody, I can't remember, showed me this trick and I was like, oh my god. Uh, when a customer says, I want to build this blah blah, how much is it going to cost? And you're like, oh god, we sort of know how much money they got, and haven't got enough money. And so it's like, okay, do you want the truth or the comforting lie? Yeah. And some people want the truth, some people want the comforting lie. They would genuinely prefer to run their organizations like, look, okay, let's just say it's this much and in six months I'll go find us some more money, right? You can't politically get the deal across the line. So I said, okay, that's fine. That's why we asked the question. You know? But I'm not in that game anymore, so I'm going to give you the truth. So, those who would prefer, you know, anyone who in the movie in the scary bit goes, ah! Do that now. The constraint in your organization may lie beyond your sphere of control or even your sphere of influence. Bad luck. <laughs> right? Now, has anyone heard the paradox of choice? Okay, so you're in a supermarket, there is one checkout queue. What is the chance that you will choose the fastest checkout queue? No chance. Shoot this man. 100%. You are guaranteed to choose the fastest checkout queue. Right? 100% guaranteed. Okay. No, you have to. You're like him. You've got to accept the premise of my question. You're in a supermarket with one checkout. Okay. So now you're in a supermarket with 100 checkout queues. 100 checkout queues. What are the chances of you choosing the fastest one? No, one percent. Work with me. So I'm not trying to trick you, right? One percent, right? One percent, right? So here's how I think about the big organisation thing, right? If you're in a company that's like you've got your, you've got your lean startup, blah blah, going on, like you're doing one thing, right? You're doing one thing. You have a system that's one thing, and you do it. The chances, that, like. I wouldn't have any problem with saying, yeah, like this clearly you're only doing one thing, like that's your value stream, improve that, right? But if you're a, a big company, the more, think of it like the checkout queues, the more things you have going on, the chances that you've randomly chosen the right thing to focus on, <laughs> diminish drastically. So. Sorry, but the bad news of you as a random person in a large organization being even close to where the constraint is are very small. Sorry. Um. <laughs> so. Sorry. That's, this is just me. I don't, I, don't know. I don't have a certificate in this, right? That's just an opinion. There is good news, people. There is good news. At any point in time, there's only one thing holding you back. That's good, isn't it? That's the happy ending. The trick is finding out what it is. And I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek. I'll take you to the final page of the book. Uh, so this movie ends where the, the big surprise ending in TOC of where most constraints in most organisations are. And I have seen this from personal experience and been surprised and go, God, he said it in the book and I didn't believe it and here I am. The constraint in most organizations are policies. That's a sneak peek at the ending. It's kind of a bit disappointing, right? We think it has to be our Kanbans and our automated testing and our blah, blah, blah. No, it'll be a revenue recognition policy or a, you know, the way we progress payment policy that creates all sort of incentives for people to 
bloody initiate projects and not finish them because they don't get any money for finishing them, they get money for starting them. And, and you create a whole bunch of multitasking hell and you're in the middle of that trying to do Kanban and think it matters. <laughs> right? So it'll be, you crawl. I think it was like, anyone had seen Apocalypse Now? It's kind of like corporate life, right? <laughs> I think of it as swimming up the river looking for Kurtz, right? Yeah. And you're just going past dead bodies and cars and eventually you swim up and there's like turds in the river and it's like, oh God. And, and you get to the head of the river and it's like, the revenue recognition policy says, right, it's, it's like very deflating. It's like the Wizard of Oz. You get to the end of the river and it's just some rule that the guy at the top won't change because of his incentives. It's really sad. And then you kill yourself. <laughs> so, that's how... Sorry. <laughs> Can I say that out loud? Okay. And then you do it. Then you go be a lean startup, right? <laughs> and you innovate the crap out of them and kick them. Okay. So that's, that's the uh, more time than I should have spent on that systems bit. And the bit I really want to focus on is this, so I'm going to have to speed up. So take everything I've said and just park it, go read up about it if you like it. It's cool, it's big, it's, you'll never get out of there alive. Uh, so the thinking stuff is, is, is based on this idea of cause and effect diagrams. Cause and effect diagram looks like this. Uh, this says if I take action A, then desirable effect B will occur. So some people might know, call that uh, an, an assertion or an inference. That's all it is. So that's saying, if I take action A, then B will happen. I can do it with an undesirable effect. So this might be, you go back to your boss and say, if we use Agile, then, sh then there'll be unicorns. <laughs> right? And he goes, oh, really? And then you go, if you take action A, then undesirable effect will happen. You might say, ah, oh, if we use waterfall, then there shall be death and despair. Right? It's like, really? Okay. But wait. This is what Goldberg said over and over and over again. When you hear someone say something, and these days when someone says something like that, I, I see what they're saying as one of these pictures. There's an assumption under every arrow. So everything anyone asserts on any topic about anything, there's assumptions. So I'll give you an example. So this diagram says if it is raining, which is a precondition in, in these sorts of diagrams, a precondition is something I don't control. It's just an environmental fact. Uh, so it's raining. I have that precondition. This diagram says if it is raining, then I get wet. Can anyone suggest an assumption that's under that arrow? Thank you. Thank you. Right? This is easy, isn't it? So you, someone's, and you might go, eh, I don't think so. Let's talk about the assumptions. So this says, if it's raining, and this is the sort of junction bit, and I go outside, then I get wet. Okay? And then we already had the umbrella guy. So I forgot my umbrella. Uh, that's a uh, precondition as well, oh, like it's too late to do anything about that. Uh, then I get wet, okay? So you get the idea. Someone says something, but there's assumptions. You expose the assumptions. Now you go, yeah, okay, well that's very clever and that's all good for a pedant engineer. But why does it matter? The reason it matters, go back here. Okay, if this is my mental model, remember we're talking about the gradation of mental models. All mental models are valid. I'm not ragging on stupid people. Like it's, it's fitness for purpose, right? If you have this mental model, if it's raining, then I get wet. Like, what is my option? What are my options for solving that problem? If that's my mental model, what are my options? No, no. This says if it's raining, I get wet. So they're stupid. I have to wait for it to stop raining. Correct. So I am a victim of circumstance. I have to wait. Right? If that's how I think, that's my option. If this is my mental model, I get another option. 
because these things have to combine to give me that effect. So I can wait for it to stop raining, or I can go inside. Okay. If this is my mental model, I can wait for it to stop raining, I can go inside, I can borrow Jason's umbrella, I can put a bag over my head, I can buy my own umbrella, if I, as long as I don't have to go outside to do it. <laughs> See what I mean? So this is why it matters to actually challenge the assumptions behind what people say. So I think, I know Jason has years of experience of people saying, that'll never work here. Jason comes and going, we're going to be agile. And they go, that'll never work here. We tried that. And it's a process of working out their assumptions and uh, their mental model of that assertion. When someone says, that'll never work here, what they are saying is either that, sorry, either that, if we take that action, bad stuff will happen, or they are questioning your assertion that if you do something, something will happen. So, the, uh, I love this expression from Goldratt. He, he, he would say, when someone says, so you go, we're going to do this, we're going to have agile and then there'll be unicorns. And then they go, but what about the people over there who are doing X, right? Every objection starts with a but. So Goldratt used to say, there's a pearl in every but. <laughs> it's, I love that, right? I love that. He also, he also used to say, every but is a gift. <laughs> right? So when someone says, but what about those guys over there who hate you and what you're doing? You go, okay, thanks for that information. I'm going to go and love them and do my consultancy thing on them and do my reality distortion field around those guys, right? So every time someone says, but it won't work, that gives you more information on how to make it work. So that's cool. There's a hand. Yeah, a quick story. Did you ever hear Steve Hayes' story? He, he went to a games company and a big bank on the same day and he was trying to sell sort of agile, leany stuff and the big bank said it wouldn't work here, it only work at something like a games company. So he went to a game... Ah! It wouldn't work here, it only work somewhere somewhere like a bank. bank. Right. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> that's great. I like that. To ring in. So, reasons why nothing you ever do might make the slightest difference. Number two, and I've only got 15 minutes to get through the next five, is failure to expose assumptions when diagnosing problems. So you try and implement Agile and get a unicorn, someone comes and cuts your legs out from under you because you had no idea that they were relevant. So, so. that you failed failing? Yeah. It must be, because <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> no, it's Jason's laptop, it's corrupted. Ah, clearly. Clearly. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Who said of the five whys? Okay. Okay. Not as many people as I would have thought. I thought Lean was cooler than that. So, uh, the five whys is uh, the, the Lean kind of thing that when you have a problem, you go, oh, why did that happen? And they go, oh, well, because it was raining. Oh, okay. Well, no, that's a bad example. Because <laughs> right. the guy had no training. Okay, why did he have no training? Oh, well, because we just hire people and give them a keyboard. Why don't we do that? Uh, you go, why, 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 why? And, you know, the five is arbitrary. The, the thinking is that if you mitigate things that go wrong to a, some measure of depth, you will end up building the leanest, most effective system because it's only demand built. And that's a good theory. I like, you know, that's kind of cool. But uh, TOC has this thing called the current reality tree, which is like, uh, makes five whys look like thinking kindergarten. So <laughs> this is five whys. You have some bad thing happen. There was a proximate cause, and maybe the cause of that was because we did something, or something broke, we hadn't noticed something. And you get to some theoretical ultimate cause. But the five is arbitrary. Don't worry about that. There's a couple of problems with that. It encourages that, that thing we were talking about, which is a problem, which is identifying a single cause, because it only gives you one, 
way to solve the problem. Like it's actually a bad habit to get into, to go, oh, I found one contributing factor to something, that's it. Right? That's actually bad because it reduces your options. So you typically take some remedial action and you get a beneficial effect. Reality tends to be more like that or even more complex. It's not just linear this cause that, this cause that. Anyone who's watched air crash investigations, like my wife does, whenever it's on, is, knows you have to get like three or four bad things, bad rare things to happen, seconds from disaster, to get the, the result, right? But the other really bad reason why five wise is like thinking kindergarten is because every chronic problem has vicious cycles of causality, right? There is no linear cause for these chronic problems. They have reinforcing loops. So that's uh, a fundamental thing in TOC when you're trained to use the thinking processes. The current reality tree is the tool where you start with your problems and try and work out what's causing them. And people say, well, when do I finish? Because eventually I get to a cause of, like, life exists, right? <laughs> like, you do, right? They call it the question of oxygen, right? Because nothing happens without oxygen, right? So if you say, well, if it's raining and I get wet and, I, and there's oxygen, then it happens. Like, they, do, they call it the oxygen problem, where you end up just going to a stupid degree of causality. But... So his answer was when people say, well, when do I stop until I get to like, because there was a big bang and, you know, was when you found the vicious cycle, right? If you're analyzing a chronic problem, his assertion, again, part of the theory, not proven, but just take it as given and try and disprove it. Find your chronic problems and try and analyze them and don't stop till you find the vicious cycle. That's something for you to try. Uh, there is a corollary to that, so reasons why nothing you ever do might make the slightest difference. Number three is failure to uh, unidentified vicious cycles mean your problems come back. There is a corollary to that. Uh, so uh, the future, the current reality tree represents your current problems and what's causing them. There is a corollary, which is the future reality tree, which is you say, well, uh, uh, we'd love to have unicorns and fairies and Kanban and scrum boards and all this stuff. And, okay, so what would we need to do to cause that to happen? So we'd have to do this and then that, and then we'd have to hire ThoughtWorks, and then we'd have to do this. And like, okay, and then that would construct that reality. And you look at that critically. And the same thing applies. If you're trying to introduce change that sticks... The, the TOC model of that is if you've designed this future and it doesn't have positive reinforcing loops of causality, you will fail. It will not stick. Are they, are they reinforcing loops or balancing loops? No, reinforcing loops. Okay. Yeah. So you want good to happen and you want the good to cause more good. Okay. Right? Definitely not balancing. Uh, Quick shout out to the tool that draws these diagrams called Flying Logic. It's the only tool I know of in the world that is dedicated to drawing TOC logic diagrams, but you can do them in uh, anything you like. Uh, TOC has a model of planning, and I've only got five minutes to go. No, ten minutes to go. Uh, which has a really catchy marketing name of the Intermediate Objectives Map. Not. Right? So, Goldratt needed to do some more marketing, right? Come up with something like the five whys and come up with come up with something, some catchy name. But uh, this is a, a, a quick model of the, the way you do planning in a TOC thinking process kind of way. You have a goal, and the goal has critical success factors, and the, ne and the critical success factors have necessary conditions. So, quick example. Now, uh, for the advanced listeners, uh, these arrows no longer mean if then in this diagram. Uh, they mean if not, then not. So uh, I don't know how to say it other than that. That's what they mean, right? They mean, they mean without these things, you will not succeed. They don't mean with these things, you will succeed. Does that make sense? Probably not. I don't care. So your goal is to run a great conference. That's your goal. Uh, now, when most people... <laughs> That's right, we'll have three umbrellas in the foyer when everyone's already wet. 
Uh, so your goal is to run a rate growing confidence. So if I said to you, okay, that's your goal, what are the critical success factors? You would brainstorm and you might come up with some stuff like this, or you need to provide it. It's critical that we have a great program and it's critical that uh, the attendees have a great, uh, you know, we provide a great experience. You know, yeah, and you'd have others. It's critical that we don't lose money and all this kind of stuff. Right? Just a quick example. And then you say, okay, well, well, what, what does it mean to provide a great experience? What are, what's necessary for that? Uh, you might say, I can't read that. What does that say? Attendees know. Attendees know what's going on. Love the venue. Yeah, right. So there's a couple of examples of things you might say. I'm not asserting this is a plan to run a great thing, but you might come up with things like that. So these are not the, the key thing. They're not tasks. They're outcomes. Uh, I can't tell you how many Agile teams I've seen that say they're writing stories when really they're writing tasks. These are outcomes. So I don't have any view yet when I'm doing this plan about how to do that. Yep. I just have an outcome. So it's an outcome breakdown, not a work breakdown, okay? And you keep doing that. So in terms of the great program, you might have, you need something for everyone and you need a mix of international speakers, and oh, not for this conference, but. Uh, and you keep going and people say, well, when do you stop? Because it just builds down like a tree in a network. And my answer as a, as a, as a development manager is when I can delegate. So. I'll get to the point where these outcomes can be delegated and then it's a different problem. But when you're doing planning, what you want is everyone involved to contribute at the uh, getting to the outcome. You don't want to treat people like people you assign tasks to, right? You do this task, you do this task. You want to create in their minds a story. It's no different to me than a user story or a story like uh, Sean Calhoun was talking about this morning because you create the curiosity gap. You describe to them that you need this thing and they go, well, my, I can see my reality is not that and I'll work out how to get there. So if you give people outcomes and delegate the outcome to them, you get a way better uh, result than if you think of all the tasks and then assign them to people and then chase them because they're not identifying with the outcome. So you plan top down, you execute bottom up. Um, and so reason number, Six, five is you're planning with tasks rather than outcomes. And I'll have to speed up. Uh, and number six, yeah, I really like this one. So the critical success factors. It's very, 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 very common that people when making plans ignore things that matter. So uh, you back, back years ago, uh, I was running a, an agile team and we built this great software and then we're, the weekend we're gonna go into production the ops guys say, no, nah, we're not letting you put that on the, that version of WebSphere. No, you can't go live. It's like, oh shit, we've been doing this for 18 months and we find it on the weekend before that we can't do it because of the, right? So there's this other person with a critical success factor as part of your goal that you've ignored. That's the model uh, under TOC. Uh, so making sure you identify everyone who's got an opinion. You know, Agile teams typically we get all UX'd and we have all scenarios for users and what they're going to do and that's all cool, but how many people go to the trouble of making personas for the ops guy that's going to be trying to read the log files and, and how many people think about the help desk person who's taking calls about this crappy system, right? We don't tend to do that. We, we we've tend to have got a, a bit of empathy for our end users more than we had a decade ago, but there's still a lot more stakeholders that we lack empathy for in commonly. Uh, now this is a really good one. When things get ugly, uh, the gold rat solution to the unsolvable problems of the world is called the evaporating cloud. Now very quickly, it's based on a conflict. Now a conflict in TOC is not like, eh, I don't like Hawthorne, I like St Kilda. Uh, it's two states of reality that cannot coexist. So this is a real example. Uh, Aconex just did our, we did our first acquisition of another business. So there's a, a whole bunch of hand wringing and angst about it. Uh, so there's a camp that wanted to buy it and there's a camp that didn't want to buy it. So you can't both buy and not buy a company. So that's a conflict. So it basically comes down to the Mick Jagger philosophy that you can't always get what you want, but you sometimes uh, you can get what you need.
So, why do the people who want to buy the company want to buy the company? They want to buy it to maximize growth. They think if they buy that, then they'll get those growth. So then you say to the people who don't want to buy the company, why, why don't you want to buy the company? Why? Why is that so important to you? And they're all about focus. Now, the gold rat th theory, and uh, this is one I have a problem with still after many, many years, uh, he would say you cannot have a conflict without a shared goal. Okay, uh, you cannot have a conflict without a shared goal. And that is a hard one. I find that hard. But, so he would say, okay, so this person's implementation of maximizing growth is to buy this company. This person's implementation of maintaining focus is not buying the company. They're both valid. The important message is to say to both those people, what you need is no compromise. That we will not compromise. You will get what you need. And so you might get to the point where you say, our common goal is to run a successful business. And to run a successful business, you need to do both those things. But we need to find another way to do one of them. So that's what the evaporating cloud, it's a, it's a conflict resolution model. It's very, very, very effective. However, it requires people to let go of their implementations of their, their goals. People get very wedded to their influence, and that's where it fails. So nothing can solve that problem. If you can't get people to let go of their implementation of what they're trying to achieve and think about other alternatives, you're screwed. Uh, so in this example, we might set up a global reseller network as an alternate way to uh, uh, maximize growth and not buy the company to maintain focus. Now, we didn't do that, so I have to update this target. Um, so reason number seven why nothing you ever do might make the slightest difference is confusing wants with needs. That's people get wedded to their idea of what they need rather than what they need. Uh, this is the book, The Goal. Uh, it's written as a novel. It's not a particularly well-written novel. Uh, but, you know, forgive that. Uh, it's, it's, it's good. Okay, so a quick test as we have to wrap up right now. Uh, who knows more about TSC than they did an hour ago? Hey! Who, was there anything remote, who thinks there might be something they might be able to use at some point in the future? Ah, uh, not bad. Okay, who had fun? Okay, we're done. Thank you, we're out of time. <laughs>